So this week, our guest is Jeffrey Hattie from Jeffrey Hattie Applied Arts. Uh, Jeffrey, you've been sourcing 20th century decorative arts for over 30 years. Uh, during this time, you've strived to bring together a diverse range of objects that express your personal view of the best design from the last 100 years of decorative arts. Thank you so much for your time and welcome to Dealing in Design. Yeah. All right, so let's start at the beginning. Uh, where are you from? Or where were you born? Where, who were your parents? I was born in Kyabram in sort of country Victoria. Okay. Spent most of my youth uh, in Moama, which is the Chuka Moama. Oh, Chuka Moama on the river. On the river. Oh, man, I go up there all the time. And so my father died when I was very young and so my mother moved back to where she was from, which was Moama or Chuka. Yeah. And so I went through school basically there. Yep. In Echuca, Moana. In Echuca, so, Moana. Uh, primary school, high school. Primary school yeah. to high school. Um, back in those days, I'm, I'm dyslexic, so um, I could only go so far because they didn't diagnose dyslexia then. Yes. You, I got to matriculation and went, shit, I can't read or write. Yeah. I'd manage to, and the benefit of being dyslexic is you learn to be a lateral thinker to compensate yeah, you for the things find a way around it if I find a way around solve it prop, solve a problem. yeah so I'm a good lateral thinker and so uh, I got to, I'd managed to talk my way to form six but at that point where they had external examinations I couldn't talk my way through it yeah, so sure. I thought to myself what do I like doing most and I thought girls <laughs> and I thought I'll become a ladies hairdresser Oh. So I left Echuca and came to Melbourne to become a ladies' hairdresser because I thought, well, that's... And all my friends went, Jay, Hattie's going to Melbourne to become a poof. <laughs> and I thought, dickheads, that's another case of lateral thinking because yeah. I thought, well, that's what I enjoy the most. So I'll just go to Melbourne and become a hairdresser. Well, that's clever, though. You went and followed something that you thought you'd enjoy, <laughs> <laughs> at least. Well, of course, but it was, an, it was a good... I was shit house at it. Um, because so that was your first job, was it? That was my first job. Sure. So I was really bad because to be a good hairdresser, you have to be a perfectionist, and I'm no perfectionist. Near enough is good enough. Yeah, OK. But it did teach me the skills of communication um, because you have to learn to sell something. And so I did that for four years. Four years. So this, uh, this is after school? Or once you uh, after, after I left. So I came to Melbourne when I was 18. And Had I your spent, parents or uh, anyone in your family lived in Melbourne before, or they were always well, country? My brother, big? no, my mother, my brother, and my sister had moved to um, Melbourne to, to university, um, oh, so okay. they lived here. Oh, so you were joining them in a way? As in well. a way, but I, I sort of didn't. I sort of came here and made my own life. Sure. Um, and then I did hairdressing, and I did that for four years. Where did you do the hairdressing? In Baronia and okay. Armadale. So it was an interesting time in hairdressing because it was when hairdressing changed from the old-fashioned sort of way of perms and sets to, you know, to modern hairdressing of today. Wow. So we did that and that was... And I loved it as a job, but I was shit ass at it. You weren't? I was really bad. I was <laughs> did really... You any, did you get any complaints? No, they kept, they, they kept me in the uh, colouring department because the hair cutting department, they just wouldn't let me near. Oh, they're just like, don't let him near the no, scissors. No, no, don't like let him near the scissors. good colours, but don't yeah, let him near the scissors. Yeah, don't let him near the scissors. Is that um, the same in restoration? You're good at colouring something? I'm, up, no, you're I'm not allowed sure. to cut anything? I'm joking. Well, no, yes. no, no. I'm the same. Like Sol, who works for me here and, and restores things, he knows that I want to, when I have a go, I go... Yeah, I'll have a go, and then I'm bored in five minutes, five and minutes. then I stop. The restoration yeah. is something you have to sit with. Uh, I'm, I'm just, uh, <laughs> it's just, I'm not very good at doing things where I have to concentrate for a long period <laughs> of time. I'm, I'm really bad with my hands, and I'm so that was fine. Well, you're very visual, obviously. I'm a very visual person, yeah. and more of a visual learner. Is what you'd say. Well, as, like I said before, I, I, I realised the difference between me and my friends was when I was setting up shared houses. Like, so I started, even when I was apprentice hairdresser, I had, I was collecting, you know, Art Deco, as they called it then. Even back then? Back then. Wow. Because that's what I, I wanted to have my house to be really... Because I got it from my mother. My mother... Um, we grew up in the Housing Commission, so... Oh. But my mother worked hard and built a house, and it was a really quite a modernist house. Um, so I grew up with really beautiful things. And when I came to Melbourne, I wanted to have a beautiful house. So yeah, I right. always had... So you were always interested in decorative I was always, arts I was always interested in decorative arts. So, you know, started then when I was doing my own house as a shared house. 
And then were the people you were living with in the share house being like, "What the hell is Hattie doing?" Like why? exactly, yeah. <laughs> like as if they give a fuck. Why they care what it, they don't care what it looks like. Uh, and they, they just want to have another bong, you know. <laughs> so, so the thing is that so then I sort of lived by myself for a long time. Then slowly but surely, I had lots of friends who were artists, and um, they had studio spaces, and a friend had a big studio space in the city. Back in the day, when you could have a humongous, you could afford to have a, something large. In, in the this city. is right <laughs> in the city, off King Street. What, they you, had, what, what about when? when oh, in the eighties, early eighties, yep. and then because they had a big space, I rented a corner off them just so I could put all the excess shit that I was buying. So you, you at that stage, you were gathering things. Yeah, because I'd buy more things. Yeah, because yeah. I was buying things, and I thought, well, that's a good thing. So from there, I had a friend, and we both started buying things, and then we decided, well, you know, look at all this shit. What are we going to do? Let's open a shop. So that was probably the moment when you thought we could start doing this for a living rather than just... It just ended up there. People say, yeah. how did you start this? And you think, well, sure. I just... I was unemployable. Yeah, you know? OK, so, so you had to create I something. had to create my own job. Yeah, wow. And that was the only way I could do it was by just buying shit and selling it. Yeah. I didn't mean... It didn't ever have a purpose... But then we started and then I've always sort of... Been, so the shop was reflective and it was called 20th Century Design. Um, and that was the first time a shop had actually been about post-war design. And also a shop that had decor, so it was the 80s. So yeah. the first shop was painted pink and grey. Wow. At that time, was there many other shops like that? None, I would none. say there'd be almost none. None, none. none. Um, and so we did that. And that was sort of moderately successful for two young men who were sort of focused on work and fa like focused on work twenty percent of the time and <laughs> focused on partying Enjoying the rest. The rest. <laughs> the rest. <laughs> so that was reasonably okay. And we managed, and considering we couldn't do anything else, that was fine. Um, and that sort of grew. And and from that, it's been just a process of learning, refining, refining. The whole and, and, and learning from mistakes and learning what you want to do and what it is to be in business and what you have to do to keep business going. So, so was that a fairly large learning curve or was it just you just No, it's over just, time? Ju just just learned, just just you just had learnt it and sure. adapted it and, and you form your own personality of how you decide business should be. Sure. So w I've always decided that you never sold things that you didn't think had some merit. Um, you yeah. never bought anything because you thought it might sell. You buy things. That you, you buy like. things you think that have merit, that yeah. are good, from your knowledge and your understanding. So that understanding and not, and so because you have a, it's driven to understand more, and also an ego thing about I want to sell the best. Yeah. I want to be the yeah, biggest you, dealer on yeah, the block. Sure. So that part of it's driving you too. But not from a money point of view because it's never about the money. You want the, the design and the item to speak. Well, yeah, but you also you want to be able to... You sort of like start to learn and then you sort of see something and you think, geez, I want to be able to sell that, but I mean, I can't because I'm in no position. Um, I can't get those prices. Yeah. So how am I going to get to the top of the pile? How am I and going how, to get... How, how would you do that, as in... Well, by, by most of all, integrity um, and the fact that you always made the customer right. You never, ever burnt people. Yeah. Um, and that was... And so when you sort of said before about... And then I, a mentor was a guy called Copel, uh, Rodney de Seuss, had a shop in Rodney Queen de Street, de Willara. Sure. And... I would go there and think, wow, this is just... Be I want to be Rodney de Seuss. Was he doing a similar thing to this? He was or? doing the... Be his shop was always immaculate. It was beautiful. Oh, really? And it was always so beautifully presented. So that became my business model. Sure. You know, I wanted to be Rodney de Seuss. I wanted to sort of have a shop that people go, wow. wow. And that's sort of... So you don't think it... You just... It just becomes part of you. Yeah, what you want to do. That's what I want to do. Yeah. I want to be that person. Yeah. I want to have that shop. And Copeland de Seuss was a beautiful shop. And you knew that everything in there was just beautiful. And, I, and so, it obviously, it appealed to my aesthetics. So that's what I did. And slowly but surely, over 35 years, that's what we've done. And so you never really dealt in trends. You've been more... I've always believed that 
So then, so you sort of end up in places where... You wouldn't have expected to No, go. it's more the thing all of a sudden you say to yourself, well, do I want to do that? And you go, so you've got to justify it in your head, so what am I doing? Yeah. And you think to myself, if I see people who are selling things that are because they think that that is the trend, well, obviously it is. Yeah. It's time to move on. Yes. Because yeah. of the old, that old school yard game of musical chairs. When the music stops, you are selling all the things that used to be fashionable. Yeah. And and it is fashion. Don't don't ever get it wrong. Yeah, it is fashion. It is always driven. There's a certain element of fashion. But after... And the, the benefit of being in business for, like, 35 years, selling basically the same thing, but not the same not thing... Not the same thing. ..is that you realise that you're dealing with a really small percentage of the population... Yes. ..who want to have the things... And it's, it's a biggest picture thing. And um, reading that small percentage of the population, is that can that be difficult? No, it's... it's you, really, you're dealing to yourself. Ah, uh, yeah, yeah, <laughs> you know? yeah, sure. So you, what you're doing is just hoping that I want to do something that I think is good and hopefully there's other people out there who understand what I do. Yes. And so, therefore, you realise that there is... And the, that percentage never changes. That, you know, when I first started, I was dealing to 0.0061% of the population, and I still am. Yes. I mean, be it 0.0061 of 12 million, and now it's 20 million, so there's more of them. So there's them. more of them. In, yeah, the same kind of Yeah, market. so, you know, because I've always been really conscious of not being fashion, but being... Aware, I always thought that... Because I used to love dressing and clothes and stuff, and I used to always think admire people who were... I, from my point of view, I used to think the most fashionable person is the person who I know knows that they're not fashionable. Yeah, I, yeah And sure. that, that they're so aware of what fashion is that they're not following it deliberately. Yeah. And they're the coolest person on the block because they're an individual. Yeah, yeah. So, and I sort of thought that's what I always wanted to do. Um, yeah, so, that's very true, like that timeless kind of look rather than uh, what's well, happening no, not, at the Well, no, just that they know enough to know that basically fashion, that that is fashion, so I'm not yeah. going to do that. Yeah. I'm going to be beyond that. I'm yeah. going to lead things. So, you know, it's... Hello. The, um, so, it, it, so it was always that. So, and it was always to your own... Um, Playing and to your own drum sure. and, and being true to yourself. Yeah. And, and I thought that also that you should never stand still because then people put you into a little pocket and, and they, they go... Pigeonhole you. Pigeonhole you and say, I'm not going down there. Basically, um, we know what he sells. Yeah, who needs to go there? Yeah, sure. And so if you constantly let people know that you are constantly moving and constantly changing, changing. and trying to forge forward selling things ahead of the market then it's worth going to. Yeah, and it's desirable and people want to show Well, I think at least they bother to come. Yeah, yeah, like they, they <laughs> don't know what to expect. Yeah, exactly. Sure. Is so there any time you doubt that your judgement... Oh, all the time. Well, yeah, of course I make huge mistakes <laughs> um, <laughs> because sometimes things arrive and, you know, I've bought them and I get them here and they... I get, so people sort of say, the container opens and you go... Oh, it's like Christmas, and it is. Yeah. But then sometimes Christmas can be very disappointing. You go... <laughs> Like Jesus, oh, I buy that, and how much did I pay for it? What, what was I thinking then? What was I thinking? <laughs> yeah. And and there's all sorts of things you're thinking. There's your ego, who you're dealing with, and so trying to make those. And I say to people all the time that, first of all, you you you, you buy with your heart. You 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 look with your heart, and you and you buy with your heart. Yeah. And then you engage your business brain. The next step. Of the that, next step. Yeah. So is that a beautiful thing? How much is it? Yeah. Can I actually buy that and take it and cost all those things, fix it, Shipping put it, it up and put it on the floor and if I have to, and that's what it's going to have to be when I sell it, yeah. can I stand in front of that object and go, I want $20,000 for that yeah. and I need to know, I know that's worth twenty, and that's part of what you, where you grow too yeah. is that you sort of, you get the confidence to go, you know what? That is worth. That is worth it. Once that, this happens, a, once that happens, once that's going to be worth, and that is worth five thousand yeah. dollars. So you have to sort of learn all the time about what something is and what it's worth, and that's a really good thing to learn. You know, yeah. what is something worth? A changing game as well, isn't it? Oh, for sure. It's yeah. forever. When was your first overseas trip? Because uh, you've been going for, for a long Europe, time. For a long time. Uh, 
probably, I think I probably went in the late 90s. Yeah, probably about the late 90s, yeah. early 2000s. And a, and a, and a great, you know, <laughs> it was, it was, of course, it was the raison d'etre of what you want to do yeah. was in a dealer was to go overseas and do containers. That's yeah. that's when you when that's you your made pinnacle, it. Isn't that's it. That's your pinnacle. That's, that's when you've that made is, it. Yeah. So you're sort of always aspiring to that. Yeah. So it's and that's a and that, so that's what you're sort of doing is saying you get to this point and then you start buying things overseas. Well, that's another move and that's another shift in a learning curve. It's a, and it's a big moment in your career, isn't it, to make that step. And not have it sink you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because yeah, it's it's investment. Heavy, isn't it? Well, it, 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 it's it's you know, and and you make mistakes, and also you learn from every time you go. You learn, and the thing that people and which is and so, what people don't understand is why has everything been so French centric? French centric. Um, yeah. Yes. Since the seventies. And you wonder why everything is so... Everything's about French antiques. Well, the reason being is that the French invented the professional fair. No other country in Europe does it, and the antique, professional antique fairs in France are quite remarkable. Yeah. They're remarkable because they figured out a system where any dickhead can do it. <laughs> you know, so what you do is you sort of, like, you send your money to the shippers... And anyway, it's a quite complex, but it, yeah, it makes it really easy. You go out and buy the shippers, go collect it. Yes, yes. exactly. Yeah. And it makes it all sort of fairly seamless. Yeah. No other country did that. So they streamlined it. That yeah, kind of point. exactly. So I decided at that point when I started to go where everyone went that I was going to go elsewhere. I was going to actually start buying where no one else was oh, buying. Oh, so you didn't do France then? Or you I did do, it, no, I do. I did France like everyone did because yeah. that's what you do. Yeah. But at the same at the same hand, I decided there's got to be other things other than France. Wow. So I went all over Europe uh, thinking that... I, and it was a good thing to do because, you know, like I, I went to Spain. I went to Spain five times. Wow. Spain, and... Okay thinking, no, I'm missing something, you know, I can't find anything to buy, it must be something, I've, there's got to be something here. And then after five times I realised, well, there's nothing here. There's, the, yeah. A, because I'm a 20th century dealer, that Spain has this particular history, which of Franco, yeah. so basically there is no 20th century okay. design, okay. there was Franco right through the, you know, the 20th century, so there's nothing there. There's, it, so you start to sort of get this idea of, of each country having its own history. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah. You know, and you have to choose where you'd want to go. Yeah, and so, you know, I, I, I did... Uh, back then, we started trying to do all the um, communist countries sort of coming out of, you know, perestroika. Yeah, so we wow. would go to Czechoslovakia, we would go to Riga. Um, but then you sort and of... this is early 90s, is it, when you No, no, this, oh. is, this is early 2000s. OK. And we sort of... Mostly because I was doing it with a guy then um, called Boris... And um, Boris was a, a, a Latvian. So we would go. But then I realised, well, yeah. there was some really... And so you've got to be reading and looking at what you're doing and you, re and you think, well, <laughs> one of the things about communism is is that it has... Because it, what it takes away is that entrepreneurial thing. Yes, so sure. nothing is saved. Yes. So any antiques that were there, well, why would you keep them? Why would you save them? Basically, you can't sell them. Yeah. You can't sell them up through the system. There's no market for There's it. There's no market. Yeah. And so the houses are run down because, well, why fix it? Yeah. You know, why are you going to do it? The roads are run down. Why fix it? So after a few sort of aborted attempts going to, you know, all of that, I ended up in Italy. Italy, yeah. And that was where it all started again for Mid -century me. Mid-century Italian design. Yeah. And you sort of, you sort of start to... You know, I, I went, there was lots of side things. So when this, everyone started doing Danish, which I sort of found incredibly ho-hum, not for any other reason that I thought it's, you know, it's nice. Yeah. But really what you're getting here is container after container of domestic yeah. Danish furniture. Yeah. And also it starts to reflect of, of the country that it's from. It's, it's safe and it's well-made and it's good value. It's functional, good value. It's value. And it is. So I thought, ah... Oh, Okay, what's the most populous country in the whole of Europe? The Netherlands. So I decided I'd do the Dutch. While everyone was doing Danish, I'd do Dutch. Okay. Um, oh. 
I didn't realise that that wasn't going to happen <laughs> because it was another system in, in the Netherlands. The Netherlands are very, very powerful dealers, but it, because it's a, a fairly closed system, you know, you could go to warehouses and they'd have, you know, 500 of Alfred Hendricks dining oh, chairs. Yeah. And you think, fantastic. But then they're not going to sell them to you for 50 euro each. Yeah, it is. They want 150 because they're very, very powerful dealers and they sold it amongst themselves. Yeah. So there was never... And to do that, I would have had to start a shop all to tell the story of Dutch decorative arts. Sure. And it's very severe and very, very... <laughs> it's, it's Dutch and yeah. they're very severe p people. Yeah. So I gave up on that. And then I started doing Italy around the same time. And then I realised that, you know, Italians are probably the most design-conscious people in Europe. Okay. And you've got to go where their money is. Yeah. You know, I mean, you can't go to countries... Like, you don't go to Portugal... Because you yeah. know there's never been any great money in Portugal. Yeah. So you need to go where there's been a large upper middle class involved in design. Yeah. And you get no sense. better place than Italy. Than Italy. You know, say, for example, you know, French, French are very, basically are fairly conservative people, Catholics. Sure. So a very wealthy Frenchman would basically own antiques. That's what you. That's how you'd express yourself. French antiques, yeah. French antiques. Just gilded but, uh, marble. Yeah, but, <laughs> um, but Italians, a wealthy Italian will have, you know, 17th century coffer yeah. and a Joe Ponte table. Yeah, they, chrome. And, they yeah. have everything because they, they are so stylish. Yeah. So the place is groaning with it and hence why the move, it's, everything's moved there. Yes. But now it's time to move away. So I'm trying to find. You're trying so, to find somewhere else. Now. I'm trying to find somewhere else. You get in early to places. Well, you've got to you've got to sort of stop when everyone else is going, and it's just, and things change. You know, lots of things change. When I first used to go to Italy, I could go to warehouses, and these people had already sorted through the system, and and it's in the warehouse. They had no way of. They know what it's worth, but they had no way of getting it to the market. But when auction houses started to sort of start having 20th century sales, well, then they started to have access to the, being able to get yes. the absolute maximum for it. Yep. So I would go and see, look at a, a warehouse and there'd be a Gio Ponte desk there. In the past, I, I would have been able to go, yeah, OK, it's $10,000 worth. They knew that, I knew that, but yeah. basically they had no way of getting the $10,000 because okay. they couldn't afford a, a smart shop in Milan. Yeah, sure. But... Now, because there's the whole of American decorators, the whole of the American system, they're all trolling through, so they just send it to auction. Yeah, okay. And if it doesn't sell, you can buy it afterwards. You can buy it afterwards, <laughs> and then you're left with the other stuff. <laughs> well, you know, and it's so... It is that thing. So, uh, for us, it's been um, about developing systems in Italy, and, and we did that. And But I, when I first started in Italy, it was, <laughs> it was a very shoestring and, and sort of... Yeah, hiring warehouses off mafiosos and oh. you know, it was like it was very dodgy. But anyway, yeah. we, we made it through and now it's, we've got a very good system. And we and I love, don't get me wrong, I love Italian things. Yeah, sure. And I still find it the most exciting place. And for me... Some of the most impressive designs I find Italian stuff. They just min they can be minimal, but it's exciting. Well, you know, with Italian things, it's about <laughs> when they stop. It can... Yeah. You have to be able to pick the part the, it, its exuberance and its energy is f essential but at some point they it's just too much yeah so you just have to pick it and you have to know which ones and, and i and for italy because i've been going there so long a, a lot of it now is just going to visit friends oh, okay yeah not, not as much dealing over there well I, I used to sort of like really try hard to find new places and new warehouses now I just go and deal with the people I know. You know. And they're sure. my friends. Yeah, you know. sure. So they know me, I know them. Um, and I like that. Um, and then I've started, you know, going to Germany is my, my thing I'm doing at the moment. Oh, so you're starting to move into Germany. Mm. But then that's because I'm going backwards, not forwards. I mean, backwards in... I'm more inclined to be interested in... Going a little bit later in time. Yeah, to, no, to, uh, 1910, 1920, yeah. you know, be before basically before the First World War. Sure. And modernism. But it's a hard it's a hard slog here. It's a different it's harder and it's a different look, isn't it? The German look. 
can be a whole different. Well, modernism is hard for people to understand here. It's not. It's it's, it's academic and and, a, yeah. and it's a hard thing, and they don't get it. Whereas in Europe, it's it's a it's a very big. There's a lot of people in Europe, and modernism is is, is a part of their history. So there's a huge market, and you pay. And then you try to translate that to Australia, and it's, they just don't get it. So, yeah. but it's all right. It's yeah. a challenge, you know, to make it work. And that's hard. Um, the yeah. excitement. Is there, has there ever been a standout moment in your career that, that you would? Uh, you know, surviving. Yeah, just maintaining. <laughs> just as in being talking. able to keep the doors open. Yeah. yeah. Um, uh, look, you know, over the years, it's been things, and I've I've seen some amazing things, and and you know. Um, it, it, to me, it's always about learning and, and, and learning more and learning more and understanding more, therefore making my job easier because I know what it is and I know where it's from. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, no. I, look, you know, there's, there's some amazing... And it's a great life. And I remember well, one time I went to a house and this woman rang me and I went there and... And she had all this glass, and I had no idea what it was. And and it was sort of, you know, it's just Czech. And she'd bought it in America, in, in Rodeo Drive. Yeah. And and then, so anyway, so I bought it. I, I didn't know what it was, so I didn't buy anything. And then I sort of went back to my office, and I researched, and I realised what it was. But they, by this stage, and she'd offered me something that was in the basement, and she showed me a picture, and I said, oh, I don't want it. <laughs> um, and then she goes and moves to Russia, where, and then she comes back. And all of, in that time, I'd realised that the panel that she had downstairs was by really the most famous glass artists in the 20th century, oh, which wow. is Lubinsky Braktova. And it's worth, <laughs> you know, $200,000. Wow. And I let it go. But then she comes back and it t and she puts it all into auction. Oh. And I bought it. And I bought it and I paid a lot for it because someone else knew what it was. Anyway, so then I decided I was going to send it. I was still young at this stage, so I, I did brash things. Just, yeah, ballsy. Uh, yeah, I did ballsy things. <laughs> so I decided I'm going to sell this in America. So I shipped it to New York <laughs> and I... I sent it to a person I knew over there. It arrived. I had a stand made for it. It arrived in a big box. It was a big panel. And I was going to get it into the biggest dealers... Um, get it, the biggest dealer in New York to sell it for me because he dealt in it. Just hoping it doesn't break. Well, it arrived. The stand had broken. Oh. So, and I had an appointment for him to come uptown and look at it and see if whether he'd take it on consignment. And the stand had broken. So I, in the middle of New York, I went downstairs with this huge you know, iron stands and went around New York and found someone to make it and fix it for me, take it back, got it in the stand. He came down and said, yeah, it's fantastic, I'll sell it for you. And oh, that was probably... Wow. But I wouldn't, couldn't do that today. Yeah. I just would be, just A, I'd be, don't be an idiot. Yeah. Um, <laughs> a little bit more conservative. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and that is that thing about what I love about being a young person is where you sort of, you have no Caution fear. Caution to the wind. Yeah, yeah. yeah I'm going to do this. And, mm. and so that... That was a great thing to do. But, you know, I've seen some incredible things over the years. So where do you look for inspiration? Is it just in... Is it a designer or a magazine? Or I, I just constantly... I just constantly want to refine my idea of being able to understand what is good and what is bad. That's yeah. all I need. You know, it's like... I, for, for inspiration, I, I... Like I said to you before, I understand the world visually. I have yeah. to... So other people might understand it spiritually, financially... Yeah. But I sort of look at the world to understand it. So it's so if I go to an art gallery, I'll, I'll go through the art gallery in five seconds and then I'll stop because something has made me stop. Yeah, something will grab you. Yeah, and I sort of then have to say to myself, what is it? Why have I stopped? Why is it good? Why is it not good? What is it about this that I think is good? So I think that's always been the case for me, is always about trying to get better and better and better at what I do, yeah. you know, as a dealer. You know, wow. that's the aspiration. Yeah, yeah. Um, when would you be your most productive? Is there a time when you are your most I'm, productive? I'm, I'm, I'm an insomniac, so I, I'm, I'm up every morning. I can be up at 4 o'clock oh, most really? mornings. I'm overworked by 2 o'clock in the afternoon. And you're more the night owl first thing in the morning. 
I, 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 and I, I, no, I, I don't sleep a lot. So I'm um, <laughs> productive in the morning. I can't be by bothered. By the end of the day. Yeah, by, I come after 12, flagging. I just can't be bothered. <laughs> I'm not interested. After two, I'm not interested in anything. Sure. I just want to stop, yeah, go, home, go home, open a bottle of wine, <laughs> and that's it, I'm over it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's it. Are there any common myths you would dispel about the industry or something you're approached all the time with? You know, like one uh, fellow last week yeah, yeah. said it was only old people buying antiques. You know, I think people come in and say things like that. Uh, a common myth about being... Uh, I think what I... I, I've, I don't know if it's a myth, but I, th I think more... What I've always found was the discourtesy that you experience by the fact that you're a buyer and a seller. Yeah. And, and so, therefore, basically a little bit dishonest. Yeah. And, you know, the way that, you know, institutions treat you... Um, As a... As quote, like unquote, dealer, yeah, as a, yeah, as as with certain disdain, and that that and sort of they're academics, but I have to actually make a living, so my decisions are really important to me, yeah. and it's really important that I get it right. So I need to know what I'm doing. Yeah. So you know, um, there's so much more to it than financial, isn't it? Well, it depends you. on how you want to do it, yeah. I mean, if you want to do it financially, well, then that's one way of doing it. And I've never done it... For, for, and I've always believed that if you take the money out of it, then you've actually got more power. Because people will use p p money over you because they know they've got a, a trick to you. Yeah. They've got a key to you. But if you sort of walk away and say, well, it's not the money, I couldn't give a shit, I don't care if I don't own it. Yeah, yeah. Um, it doesn't matter to me. Not as I much mean, leverage on you. Yeah, they haven't got leverage. Yeah. I see so many people, you know, who sort of, you know how to, to make them, you know, how they tick. You t put money into it and then they behave in exactly the same way. So, yeah, okay, yeah. So if you, if you sort of like and be above the money, well, then you, people don't have as much leverage over you. Yeah, sure. So that's all I've learnt really in business. Yeah. And it's not what drives me. It's not certainly... Well, it hasn't been. <laughs> yeah. um, obviously not. Um, it, it's not what I do it for. But you have to have money to be a successful dealer. You have to be able to... You need to earn some money to create the space. You've got to the create the space to keep on buying things. And when things are really bad, you've got to keep on buying things. You've got to have nerves of steel. Yeah. You know, because... It's not for the faint-hearted. Yeah, like, when the money's you know, not coming in, you well, still yeah. need to go out well, and well, refine. Well, the, the bills keep coming, deal. and you still have to buy the best you can, and you always buy. So between me and my bookkeeper, who keeps me in line, <laughs> she always has to go. You are not no, going out to buy. Can't. Where are you going? Yeah, how Don't, much? You are you <laughs> Where are you going? You cannot go there. Yeah. Or my wife. I mean, a couple of years ago, I had this massive warehouse, like 500 square metres, and we had a shop. And I was planning on going overseas again, and she stood in the middle of this big warehouse and said, so tell me... What do you need? <laughs> why are you going overseas again? And I had to buy some stock. <laughs> oh, I have the same thing with the dealer I worked with. The, the, the workshop is jam-packed, can't fit anything else in. He's like, yeah, Jamie, I'm going in November. I'm like, what? Where are we going to put this? <laughs> I know, I know. It, it's... it's, it's it's, you become very addicted to the concept of buying and, and it's it's very hard not to. So my wife keeps me in check about... And, and it's an ego thing too because you just yeah. want to be out there doing it. And, and it uh, would be one of the most enjoyable part of the job. Oh, by far. Yeah. Swanning around Europe buying things... <laughs> Just delightful. That's why you, that's your raison d'etre. You know, I mean, my wife doesn't often come, and and then she came the last time she came, and we we're in we were off we were in Milan, and we we're going off on the next part of the journey was going to um, Belgium, and I, I walked in and I'd bought some things at a shop, and she, as we left, she said, "You're an idiot." You know, you did that purely to show yeah. off. Yeah. And she was right. <laughs> you know, I'm sorry. <laughs> She's correct. She's correct. And I, I bought these things and I'm never, ever... When they arrive, I'm never going to make money at them. But I was just big noting myself, yeah, I'll have that and I'll have that because uh, I'd never been there before. Yeah. And and, I, and my attitude was, oh, I'm going to make impress... I'm a big-time dealer. I'm going to impress uh, them. Yeah, I'm going to impress them. And she, we walked out and she said, you're an idiot. <laughs> That you will never, ever, ever <laughs> make a profit at that. Yeah, yeah. And, of course, I didn't say, yeah, because I went, no, I'm yeah, not. You don't know what you're, you're talking about. about. <laughs> yeah, that's it, I'm going home. <laughs> but, uh, but, it's, it's, it, but it's always growing and, and I've never become jaded. So it's all that thing, too, it's sort of like 
you know, I, I always do want to keep on buying and selling because that's essentially also what you are as a buyer and seller. And I yeah. sort of feel like, well, that's okay. That's how I can make a living right until I'm nearly dead because I love buying and selling. Yeah, it is a long game, isn't it? Mm. You can play it for a long time. Yeah, yeah. You move it into a different ways and different and you places. Go, to, go at a different pace. Yeah, yeah. 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 Um, you were speaking about your wife. How mm. important is it to have a supportive partner for you? Oh, totally and utterly. I mean, why? I mean, if I was... I'm obsessed, you know, so... Oh, with... With, with what I do. what you do. Yeah. So... <laughs> It'd be pretty boring, but and then and but we both work off each other, and she has impeccable taste, and I respect her opinion. So I always, if she tells me that it's wrong, I stop and think, yeah. and also it's it stops me being eget so egotistical, yeah. you know, because she puts it back to the dollars and cents. Yeah. Whereas I'll do the most insane and kind of illogical business things. Moment yes, kind of. and, and she'll just sort of say, Are you insane? <laughs> and I'll go, yeah, no, I'm not. <laughs> yes I am. <laughs> um, and and those silly sort of things that you do, which are ego and bad decisions. So yeah. that's why it's really important to have someone who can keep you in check and keep your ego in check and yeah, keep and someone's opinion you respect. Yeah, and, and and someone whose opinion you really respect about Things that you know and where you want it to go and what you want it to be and yeah. you know and you share a vision you know and we share a vision about what we want to sell and and where we want to take it. So, yeah. yeah. If you could send a message to yourself twenty years ago, what would you tell? Or even <laughs> what would I say to myself twenty years ago? Yeah. Less parting, more focus. <laughs> more <laughs> <laughs> but Tune that's in. that's 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 you. Uh, but on, you know that, that you couldn't say that to yourself. And you know you wouldn't take it on. Well, that's what I mean. <laughs> yeah. You could say it to yourself all your life. You just wouldn't stop it. So, you know, that's what I'd like to say. Yeah, sure. Less party, but, you know, there's, it, there's no there's, sort there's of... No point. Yeah, there's no point. Someone probably said it to you. Well, yeah. But you know that you wouldn't do it, but that's sort of really the only thing that I would do differently is perhaps, you know, be more focused and decide to make more money and be focused about... Because as I get older, I think... Jeez, I've done nothing to look after myself. Yeah. Um, and, you know, but that's okay. I don't care. Yeah. You know, that's what my life's been and that's fine by me. For you sure. Know. Yeah. Uh, if you weren't a dealer and you didn't mm. have this shop, yeah. what would you do? Uh, what would I do? Oh, well, I would love to be a DJ. Really? Music? Mm. Oh, music, everything to me, it's my greatest passion. Because I, I have this oh, thing you, about... Oh, you uh, collect records? Well, I, no, I don't collect, I collect music. I, I, oh. I've got a huge music collection. Um, it's, I have seen uh, it on your Instagram, actually. Yeah, uh -huh. and, uh, huge. And it's, and it's because I, I sort of... I'm always fascinated by people's relationship to art. And I have clients who have the most enormous art collections. And and one of my biggest sort of, sort of queries... Is I, I see... And one of the things that we, when we started this warehouse, when we started this, when we sort of decided that yes, we would still keep going and selling things, what I, I one of the reasons why I did this was, I was in Milan, and I saw something, and it was in a friend's warehouse, and he'd bought it off someone who sort of it was such a remarkable thing, and he'd bought it, obviously paid a bit because this dealer knew what it was. Well, no, didn't know what it was, but everyone knows that it was amazing. Okay. Now, he had it, and he wanted X amount of dollars for it. And I'm looking at it thinking, I know what it is. I think it's a piece of Czech cubism. And it's the most rare stuff because you, there's books on it, but really there's nothing. Uh -huh. And I thought, this is really depressing because in 35 years, I've never had a client come to me and go, you know what, Jeffrey? I want to put together a really serious decorative arts collection. And I thought, that's sad, you know, I can't actually yeah. buy this because by the time I buy this, I have to take back to say, I'm not going to have to ask $35,000 for it oh, and I'm just going to die to die with it. Yeah. And I thought to that myself... That is sad, isn't it? I thought, well, this is weird, you know, why isn't that so? And I thought, everyone... And so I've always realised that the relationship between people, what art is, art is about money and power and it's always been that way. And why do people... So... When I sell something for five thousand dollars or ten thousand dollars, it's really considered. Yeah. And then, but they buy paintings. <laughs> no, tomorrow, <laughs> yeah. 25, 45, 45, 50. 
And what is it about art? And I sort of have always, it's been one of my great questions, what is it about, and so why I lead from music, yeah. is because the th is, the, the music is, to me, is so universal. And it's, you, it's everyone can own it yeah. because we, all have, we can all buy, you know, a record. We can all join Spotify. Yeah. And, 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 well, no, but it's, it speaks to me, and it's all about emotions, and I, and, and that's what art should do, and it, and it tells, and it's, the, to me, it's the most pure form of art. So that's why I question why people need to spend fifty thousand dollars on a painting. Why? Yeah. Because a, they smell money, yep. prestige. There's no prestige in decorative arts. To be able to talk about it. Well, when, when you own a, a really love. famous artist, <laughs> and people walk in and go. Jesus, it's Brett Whiteley. They will yeah. know what it is and they know that that's who you are. Yeah. That's why you, people are quite happy to spend money on cars. Yeah. Because it expe it's an outward expression of who you are, mm. of your success and the money that you've made because that's how we judge someone's success. So I decided that when we, decided that we, do, we did this that we would try to make it, try to sort of teach people, try to get uh, uh, some people engaged with decorative arts on a deeper level where that they want to own it because it has weight, intellectual weight, yeah. and, and that's what I wanted Considered to do. Considered design. Considered, and, yeah. and people sort of are proud and put energy into it because there is nothing. There is no collectors in Australia as such. Um, and I've been doing it for... Th and I've had clients who have bought some of the most amazing things and filled houses, but do they collect decorative arts? No. no. They don't. They buy good things because they've got good taste and they bother to buy them because they've got lots of money. Yeah. But no one really has bothered to say to me, why don't we put together a really good collection? Like you sort of, you do all, you see all the web pages, you yeah. see all the auctions. Ring me when you see something that I should own. That's never happened. Never happened for you. No. And I think, I think you know, it's sad. It is sad. I think you just mm. answered my next question, which is why furniture and interiors is important to you. Oh, uh, because it's just a visual thing, and I'm a visual person. Yeah. I love art, don't get me wrong, but I love music, I love... And it's and so I ended up here because, really, I couldn't stand the bullshit of being an art dealer. Yeah. Um, and I find it appalling how we put art on a pedestal. Yeah. Um, and decorative arts, I think there's a wonderful honesty to it, and there's it's f functional, and it, it appeals... That concept appeals to me politically... You know, and I have yeah. lots of theories about, you know, modernism and what countries do modernism and, like, I, I, the English never did modernism. And, I, and you realise that part of that is that modernism is an expression that was, you know, a philosophy yeah. about a utilitarian society, a one-class society, which the Germans could embrace the most because I think as a people they're the best... They have the best attitude yeah. to society, having yeah. a cohesive one society. Yes. Yeah. The English could never embrace it because the thought of having one 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 strata sure. society is like oh what we all have to live in house so you know <laughs> we all have to live in the housing commission and and it's so I find that fascinating so that all that part of it fascinates me you know and it's in historically in the in the Australia in Australia you sort of look at what we've done and. So and so, the intellectual part of it fascinates me. You know, we recently, when we were going to start this, we put a collection, a collection together of Fred Ward. Yes. Um, so we decided that we that's what we were going to do. We we're going to because he was a true modernist in Australia. And he was, to me, a really pioneer. But then it sort of became important that basically it, it was him and a woman called May Casey. So we had a big collection of Fred Ward furniture which had been commissioned by May Casey. Okay. And May Casey was Lord Casey's wife. May Casey um, was a fabulous forward-thinking modernist woman, you know. Um, and she was in Germany. And so but it was interesting. So then it was all part of the history of yeah, her. Yeah. And because she was our... our um, uh, Eleanor Roosevelt, yeah. because she was a woman, she couldn't obtain power herself because of the t in those times. So she was really pushed her husband, and they they had a go, sort of a tilt at being making him prime minister. But anyway, she sponsored him, and back in 1932, 33, 35. Mm. So we had a big collection of that, which we sold to the NGV. Um, oh, okay. So. Uh, 
but I see. I, I always loved it because she was part of a Victorian aristocracy, and I always just made me think that. So she used to have this incredibly perfunctionary furniture that she used to commission, and I always wondered what her friends would have thought when they came around because yeah. we aspired to being English. Yes, and then. Oh, Mo's hit hard times. <laughs> yeah. Poor thing, she can't even afford real furniture. You know, yeah, and that, yeah, that yeah. whole thing that I really found fascinating. That, but that's what it was all about. Uh, that um, perfunctionary functionalism, which I love. So I love modernism. Yeah. And I suppose, after all of these years, that's where I've come back to. Is that I love. Settled back into it. Yeah. Well, it's what sort of I've realised that that's what I love the most is modernism yeah and it's what turns me on the most sure. um so the rest i don't love all the rest but i really do love that's where your heart yeah, lies yeah with modernism sure this i got a segment here it's kind of a quick one mm. it's called doesn't mm. need not much shouldn't take long because mm. that's what a lot mm. of uh antique and art dealers ask me when they want something restored well, doesn't, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> doesn't need much shouldn't take long <laughs> <laughs> so uh these questions are just quick, yeah, kind yeah, of answered ones. so uh, yeah, who yeah. do you admire the most personally or professionally Rodney de Seuss. Rodney, mm. he was your mentor. Yes, he yeah. had a shop in Queen Street, Wallara. He bought with such passion, and he owned things. He bought things in this country that you just think, in hindsight, you know, things that you know, that, that you know, unbelievable. Internationally, would be worth so much money today. Um, and sold them, and they're and they're out in the ether somewhere. Yeah, they're, they're somewhere. Know, they're there. Well, he bought Prouvé, and I, I bought things, and I've bought things from him. With just I, some of my most precious possessions, are things I've bought from him that I've bought from his collection for my collection. Yeah, and you said yeah. you've kind of based your business on. Well, and also he's way. always been integrity. Yeah. It's about quality and integrity and, and clients. So I've always sort of under, understood... Of currency. Yeah, because basically when you want to sort of like... If you've managed to stay in business long enough, when business is really bad, mm. some old client comes back <laughs> because you haven't pissed them off. Yeah, You know, yeah. you don't just burn them... You haven't burned them and, bridges and no, stung never. them. No, because when business is bad, because it has momentum, it means that you've got momentum. Yeah. It means that you've got a body of work that can push you forward still. Yeah. You know, just this week, I mean, or the last two weeks, it's been old clients. You know, that's what's been the cream of my business yeah, in the last two. recurring. Was someone come in and who I haven't seen for five years. Sure. And they've got a house full of things that they've bought from me and they've decided, you've got a spare moment. I might go down there and see him yeah. and go and buy some things. That's because they have a good feeling about all the things they've bought from you. So if you yeah. buy the things that people are, you're engaged with and they're engaged with and they feel good about when they see it, they remember where they've bought it. So, therefore, it's a good feeling. Yeah. And that's what you keep, business, as you say. It's about... and that, To me, it's always about momentum. It's pushing you forward is the fact that you've got a body of work and a body of people. Yeah. And, you know, and <laughs> when you say before about... Epiphany. When was my first like a moment? Yeah. The moment that really my, my one of the moments in my business, probably one of the most meaningful epiphanies I ever had, was a woman had rung me and she'd seen a lamp, and she said, "My husband is in." She was from Sydney. My husband is in Melbourne, um, and I'd really love him to look at it. So. She said, but he's only there Sunday. So I thought, I'll work on Sunday. Yeah. So I packed the lamp into a box. He was staying at a, a big hotel in the city. And I went to the desk and I said, Mr. So-and-so. And he said, oh, he's in the breakfast room. So he said, go in. And I went in. And the guy didn't stop eating. <laughs> I, I had to stand there and lift the lamp out and show it to him. He just looked at it, kept eating, <laughs> and said, thank you. And I walked away. Um, and I was furious. And I thought... Because my ego, my mm. whole working class ethos is like, oh, Jesus. And on the way back to the office, I thought to myself, Jeffrey, the only way, he couldn't give a rat's ass about that lamp and he couldn't care if his wife doesn't buy it. Yeah. But I'm going to make him pay for a lamp because that's the only way I'm going to get back at him. So my ego is nothing and I feel good about myself. So don't go and botch it by going, fuck you, you can't yeah, have it. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> like, um, yeah. The only way I'm going to win is by just getting by his money. Selling it to him. You're selling it to him. Yeah. So if my ego is nothing. Who cares? I'll do anything. It's hard. Never... Initially, you can you can get that kind of <laughs> egotistical reaction, but to be able to keep no, yourself no. in check. No, yeah. it, it was that moment I realised 
I feel good about myself. I don't give a shit. Yeah. You know? I remember, you know, and then, you know, not that long ago, I had to go someplace and I had to use the... the I was walking into to a client's house, a building, and he, they said, no, you can't come in. Tradesman's entrance. Oh. And I went... Yeah. I thought, oh, fuck, who cares? Who cares? Yeah, who cares? I mean, I I've copped, I've copped I'm fine. that. I'm fine by myself. Who yeah, cares? Actually, I'm okay with me. Who yeah, cares? And it actually doesn't matter. You know, no, of course like, not. Yeah, no, of course not. Yeah. No, you've got to feel... You, then you feel safe. I feel good about myself. Yeah. So I'm quite happy to use the tradesman's entrance. Yeah. Who cares? Yeah, I know, exactly. Mm. I've, I've, been, I've been there. Yeah. Um, what was I going to say here? Uh, do you have a favourite designer? Obviously, your favourite era would be... Uh, no, well, the, the designers... Uh, I probably think my favourite designer would be Ulrich. Ulrich? Gulimo Ulrich. And, I, I, and there's a oh, piece down there somewhere. Sure. Um, but, um, but, you know, of course, it's, a lot of it's them. It's a bit of a battle. Oh, yeah, no, but Ulrich, I think, is... And it's funny I should why I should say that. I, I think it's so Italian. It's yeah. so wonderfully Italian, <laughs> you know, because all the other modernists are modernists and, and they're beautiful and they're amazing and Roy Ayers, amazing and all of those things. But a, an Italian designer, I think, is, is just amazing as Ulrich. He does some... I have got a lamp in there and a thing down there, so... Sure, yeah. that's great. Uh, in business, what would be one of your strengths and one of your weaknesses? So strengths, are, for me, <laughs> I would say, from looking from afar, would be uh, visually, how visual perceptive you are. Yeah, because I think that no, a perseverance and 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 single-mindedness to not lose f focus on selling good things. Yeah, sure. Only the best things that I can get and I can afford. And a weakness would be that you would love to buy it all. Well, <laughs> no, I think it's good because I, I I can go. There's shops in in say in Milan, like Gallery Nilofray, which. They come from a really, really wealthy family. And you go there and, like, it's the biggest presence on the web and they are, and you think, oh, big deal. Yeah, Because yeah. the money can't... Because I've been forced to make... Sure, because through, you know, the fact that I don't have any money, yeah. I've had to make... The decisions are really important. Yeah. So that's how you've honed your skills. Yeah. They have to be right. You can't afford to make mistakes yeah. and you can't afford to just pay. Yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. Although some cases, when I've been really travelling well, yeah, sure, yeah. whatever. Yeah. <laughs> and oh, you've paid for it. <laughs> I've paid. And you think, really? How much yeah. did I pay for that? Uh, but, you know, but that's just life. But uh, hopefully everything, when I have done that, it hasn't been for a piece of shit. Yeah. I mean, it'd really annoy me if I'd paid a lot of money for a piece for of shit. For a piece shit. of garbage. Yeah. yeah. I've paid a lot of money for something good, but way too much. <laughs> yeah. That's done but that many a time. At the minimum, it's good. Yeah, <laughs> it, yeah, as long as it's good, that's OK. The fact that I'm never going to get my money back or lose a great deal <laughs> is, uh, is... You'd rather you know, lose it on something that's worth Well, at least it. I, I did it because it was good. Yes. You know, and I'm going to lose a great deal of money. Um, <laughs> but that's OK because... Well, it's not OK, but, you know, I'm but OK with the fact... accept it. I know why I did it. I just made a bad decision about how much I yeah. wanted it. Is there, a, is there a best piece of advice you've been given? Uh, no, I don't think I've had any advice. No advice, it's just been all... all I've learnt myself. Yeah. You know, I'm not very good at taking advice, obviously. <laughs> oh, that would seem to have worked for you. Mm. Well, I can't thank you enough, Jeffrey, for joining mm. us. You've been mm. very generous with your time. You're a giant in the profession. <laughs> uh, you're incredibly knowledgeable. Mm. Uh, Mm. and you sure have lived quite a life. I genuinely wish you all the best and thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. And thank you, Tim, for staying for all that time. <laughs> <laughs>